Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Challenges Related to Large Diameter Sewer Design, Installation, and Testing. Before we begin today's presentation, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All of the tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking the arrows in the top right corner. Helpful resources are bookmarked in the related content tool. Our webinar today is scheduled to last for one hour and will include a question and answer period. If you have a question, please type it in the question box at any time. Please complete our brief survey for PDH credit and at the conclusion of today's webinar, we will provide more information on how to get their certificate. Today's webinar is hosted by Bob Kerr, Ryan McCaslin, Thomas Brown, Justin Walton, and Andrew Jenkins. Bob Kerr is the Vice President of Plastics here at Contec. He joined Contec in 2013 as the Director of Product Plastics. Bob has served the pipe industry for over 28 years in various roles of increasing responsibility, including manufacturing, distribution, sales, and product management. Ryan McCaslin is the Area Pipe Manager for the Northwest and Southwest regions. He has been with Contec for more than 20 years and has experience in manufacturing, construction, and marketing for very civil engineering construction materials. Justin Walton is the Area Pipe Manager covering the Southeast and Mid-South regions. Justin now has over 29 years of experience in the storm drainage, wastewater, underground containment, and trenchless structural reline sectors. Thomas Brown is the area pipe manager covering the South Central region. He has over 14 years of experience in civil and environmental engineering, construction oversight, and project management. Thomas is a registered professional engineer in eight states. Andrew Jenkins is the area pipe manager covering the Northeast region. And for the past 20 years, Andrew has held multiple leadership positions here at Contec. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Bob Kerr to get us started. Thank you, Jill. Uh, as Jill said, my name is Bob Kerr and I'll be the host for this uh, webinar today. And I'd like to start by thanking everybody for joining us. You're all busy and we appreciate you taking some time out to join us. Uh, we're gonna be talking about large diameter piping systems today. And for our purposes, we tend to uh, consider that anything 30 inch or larger in diameter. So for all piping systems, proper design, installation and testing is, uh, is important, but for large diameter systems, they require special attention simply because uh, the, the, uh, the risks are higher. Uh, while there's no way to fully explore all the aspects that are important to uh, large diameter piping systems in one hour, uh, we would like to bring your attention to a few of the, the more critical topics. Our hope is truly that today will be get the beginning of a conversation and that you will uh, reach out to us with anything that we can help you with in the future. So uh, real quick, Contech is uh, a provider of solutions for engineers, contractors, uh, architects, and owners. Our portfolio includes bridges, drainage, erosion control, retaining wall systems, storm and sanitary sewers, and stormwater management products. We are headquartered in Westchester, Ohio. Uh, we currently have over 1,400 employees across the company and uh, uh, around 60 facilities to manufacture our products. Uh, our footprint is includes every major city and all 50 states. So our, our speakers today will focus on the primary areas of material selection, handling and installation, jointing, and post-installation leak testing. Um, at the end of this, I will wrap it up with a brief introduction into the, some of the ways that Contact can assist you with these uh, projects. And just as a teaser, at the end of the presentation, I'll share with you a new product that we just introduced uh, that we believe will allow you and your clients to design and install higher performing, long, longer service life projects that allow developers and municipalities to do more for less and to better serve their customers and constituents today and into the future. With that, we'll kick it off with Ryan and Ryan's gonna talk with us about uh, how we select the correct pipe materials. Let's go, Ryan. 
Thank you, Bob, and hello, all you glorious people. Excited to be here to talk to you today, and we're going to talk about available pipe materials. And to reiterate what Bob said, uh, you know, we, we're classifying everything 30 inch and above as large diameter. Uh, in some cases, it's going to be 60 inch and above that you'll see here. So what I want you to do is, is kind of remove from your mind the, the collection sa sanitary sewer. We're talking about uh, uh, trunk lines and, and interceptors, large diameter storm sewer. So please keep that in mind as, as we continue on. I, I'm going to talk about how to categorize a couple different uh, pipes in a couple different ways. And the first way that we're gonna discuss is really more theoretical and, and from a design perspective, and that's a homo homogenous material versus composite materials. And this is really focused on how, how the material is made. So as the name might suggest, homogenous means it's, it's one, one material in there. And an example here would be vitrified clay pipe or VCP or plastics. And relatively easy to analyze from a structural perspective. If you need to address higher amounts of, of fill height or, or live loads, uh, you simply either add more material or you can look at ways to corrugate it. Um, if you look at it from a composite material, uh, you get a lot of positives from composite materials in that uh, materials do have drawbacks. Every material has one. So for example, concrete does not perform well in tensile capacity. So we add steel to it in order to address the, the drawback that you might get with unreinforced concrete. So that's why RCP is a composite material. Uh, fiberglass is a composite material and steel reinforced polyethylene. You'll hear myself and Justin go into more detail about uh, polyethylene and plastics as a whole. Uh, steel is added so that we can uh, take into account higher and consistent amounts uh, of modulus of elasticity as well as tensile properties. So moving on to something you might be a little more familiar with is classifying pipe into two ways, rigid versus flexible. And we're gonna start on this slide with rigid first. Examples would be reinforced concrete pipe or vitrified clay pipe. And virtually what it's doing is it is taking uh, the vast majority of the structural capacity of, of that pipe. Uh, very little structural capacity is coming from the soil around it. Here you see that the, if structural distress occurs, uh, if you get deflection greater than 2%, you're gonna start seeing cracks. You're going to see uh, load, load passing off into other areas. So this is something where RCP or VCP you're going to, to see. And what the, the main question here that you're going to get is, does that mean I don't have to pay attention to the backfill or the bedding? And the answer to that is no. Uh, you need very good bedding, uh, actually stronger than that of flexible pipe because that you got you have to limit or reduce the amount of uh, differential settlement. And then the backfill around the pipe, while the pipe is capable of carrying those loads, the backfill is going to be carrying the loads of, of the structure on top of it. So. Uh, you see in the picture on the right, uh, you've, you're still backfilling with a good, capable material uh, because uh, not necessarily because the pipe needs it, but because the, the structure above it needs it. Moving on to flexible materials, you're going to see examples of SRPE or steel reinforced polyethylene. You're going to see other plastics. Here I've got it broken into two subgroups, rigid plastics and viscoelastic plastics. Justin goes into a little more detail about this when he's talking about joints, but just know for the time being that rigid plastics and viscoelastic plastics handle loads differently. So not all plastics are created equal. Um, they each have their own drawbacks and, and strong points. And finally, fiberglass <clears throat> is, is a, a flexible pipe as well. So they can handle higher degrees of deflection. Here you see 5% to 7.5%. Just know that there are at least four factors of safety built into that already at that 
at that level. And in the detail on the left, you'll see that uh, an over-exaggerated uh, deflection showing that as the pipe does deflect vertically, it's picking up soil uh, strength from the soil that's surrounding it. So the final way to, to look at pipes is one way of resiliency. And this is really, uh, you might think of it as durability, uh, but think of it as uh, every application, uh, all pipes do not belong in all applications. So there are some, some pipe applications, let's say for example, you're considering using a plastic material, uh, but the pipe has uh, is hotter than normal, it's 180 degrees. Well, plastic pipes don't work well in that type of application. Uh, similarly, in sanitary sewer applications with concrete pipes, uh, with the flow that's going through the pipe and, and uh, biological processes happening, um, you get H2S gas, which is converted to sulfuric acid, and that acid attacks the cement. So an unlined concrete pipe in a sanitary sewer, generally speaking, is not the best of ideas. So um, conversely, uh, SRPE or fiberglass, they, they work very well. They're virtually inert with um, a sulfuric acid and many other types of, of contaminants that might be in different flow rates. So all of that has to be considered uh, in terms of determining what type of pipe to use. Finally, every webinar we do like this, uh, we get lots of questions about pricing. And you can imagine it's pretty difficult uh, from a national perspective to try to figure out, okay, um, how do some pipes compare to others? So this is a, a national look and we start at 30 inch diameter. Remember, we're, we're looking at large diameters here and you can see they all virtually converge when we get to that 30 inches anyway. Um, you do see some, some things like the solid wall polyethylene that in some places or, or most places is, is no longer available once you get above 60 inch diameter. Uh, but you do see RCP, SRPE and fiberglass going all the way up to 120 inch. And you can, you can see how the costs of each are related at each diameter. So hopefully that gives you a better idea of some pricing points of, of different materials. Uh, from 30 inch up to 120 inch. And then finally, uh, my last slide is kind of wrapping all of this up into a case history. And this case history comes to us from, from Iowa. And the reason why I selected this one for everybody was because the, the city and the engineer looked at using multiple materials. They allowed different materials and allowed the contractor to figure out what would work, which would work best for them. So in this case, it was a storm drain material here, and the, the, they allowed steel reinforced polyethylene as well as reinforced concrete pipe. And the contractor chose to use SRPE for, for various reasons, uh, price being one of them, but also longer stick lengths as well as, as lightweight. Um, the weight here is is 70 some pounds versus that of concrete pipe. So uh, for the contractor who had to wheel in every single one of these sticks, uh, they were they thought they'd be able to do this much quicker using the Duramax than they would with uh, the, the Duramax SRPE than they would with the reinforced concrete pipe. So that's gonna wrap up my short section today. Uh, Jill, I believe we have a poll question we're gonna ask, is that correct? That's right, Ryan. Here's our first question today. Have you ever been involved in a 30 inch or larger diameter sewer project? Yes or no? To submit your poll answer, please click the answer on your computer screen and then click the submit button. I'll give you some time now to mark your answers. And while you're doing that, Ryan, we had a good question come in. So I'll just ask it to you right now. Oh, okay. Why would someone design with a rigid pipe material instead of a flexible pipe material? That's a good question, Jill. Uh, I, I would say there's probably two reasons why somebody would do that. One, uh, it might be that's what they or their their office have, have always done. So it might be that's just the way we've always done it. Uh, I think the other answer would be one that's more of a misperception and one of uh, being concerned about load carrying capacity. I think that 
A lot of people might be surprised to learn that flexible pipe, uh, some flexible pipes can handle more heights of cover than, than a rigid pipe can. And, and the reason being is you are integrating the, the, the strength of the soil uh, around the pipe itself. So I think those are the two reasons. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you everyone for participating in our poll. I'll show the, share the results now. It looks like 64.4% say yes and 35% say no. I'll turn it over to Bob now to introduce our next segment. Thank you, Jill, and, and thank you, Ryan. It's good to see that folks are uh, a, a majority of the audience that's been involved with large diameter projects. Uh, so we're gonna move on now and we're gonna talk about handling and installation. And uh, Thomas is gonna uh, guide us through this part of the journey. Uh, Thomas is relatively new with us. He's joined us in the fall of this year and he's our area pipe manager responsible for Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So uh, welcome Thomas to the team and uh, let's talk about handling and installation, Thomas. Thanks, Bob. And thank you everyone for your attention today. As Bob mentioned, I'm here to talk about your challenges with handling and installation for large diameter sewer projects. It's fundamentally the same as small diameter, but realistically, all the little things matter more at the larger scale. The pipe is bigger, heavier, and it's much more expensive. Well, first off, the pipe needs to get to the site. This is typically coordinated by the manufacturer, but it's important to remember large diameter sewer projects often require a lot of truckloads to get all the pipe on site. The first challenge is then unloading and staging or storing the pipe. Depending on the pipe lengths, diameters, weight, and how it's loaded on the truck will all determine the best unloading practices. So it's important for the contractor to plan for how the material will arrive at the site and follow manufacturer recommendations for unloading and handling. Some pipe products can be easily unloaded with a forklift, while other pipe material may require a large excavator or crane. It's important to inspect all pipe material for damage when it arrives at the site and any damage should be noted on the bill of lading. The main challenge is to not damage the pipe and a lot of damage, especially with the large diameter pipe happens after delivery and before the materials are installed. So contractors should take great care at all times when handling any pipe products. Large diameter gravity sewers can be designed with several pipe materials as Ryan showed. And the most important consideration for any installation is safety. Excavation and trenching can present many installation challenges. The in situ soil classification is generally used to determine the excavation and trenching requirements. And depending on the depth, it may require an excavation design by a professional engineer. Trench protection options include sloping, benching, shielding with trench boxes, bracing, and shoring. It's also required to provide access and egress, a safe working area, and potentially confined space monitoring. A best practice when trenching is to excavate just ahead of installation to prevent trench destabilization. And it's always important that excavations are routinely monitored by a competent person for changing conditions. The second crucial challenge for large diameter sewers is to control the load and deflection during installation. The weight of the backfill material covering the pipe and any live loads at the surface all contribute to the total load applied to the pipe. The maximum burial depth varies depending on the pipe material and diameters as it relates to the profile wall thickness and the strength of those materials. The load on the pipe creates tension forces on the outsides of the pipe at the three o'clock and nine o'clock positions and along the interior crown and invert of the pipe. Excessive load on a rigid pipe can cause cracks and this can further increase over time as differential settlement occurs. There are several factors that may affect the total deflection of a flexible pipe. Some thin walled thermoplastics experience sag from the weight of the pipe, especially in hot conditions. This is why the cost of solid wall plastic pipes rises significantly with the diameter as it requires more material to main the, maintain the required dimension ratio to achieve the same strength. Installation deflection from backfill placement, compaction, and construction loading is typically in the two to 3% range 
with proper design and installation practices, which I'll discuss more in a few slides. Lastly, there is leg deflection, which occurs over several months after installation as water infiltrates and the soil settle. Leg deflection is typically one to 2%, but this can increase significantly if the design backfill specifications are not met. The first step of a typical direct bury sewer pipe installation is excavation down to the design foundation or subgrade. Small diameter installations often only require trenching that can be achieved with one bucket width, whereas large diameter installations may require several bucket widths. So it's important for the engineer and contractor to determine what the excavation and trenching requirements are and how it will affect pipe staging and picking reach, specifically in regard to the pipe's length and weight, as some projects have tight working area constraints. Then a bedding layer, typically four to six inch thick, is placed to support the pipe and distribute the load on the bottom foundation. Following elevation and grade verification of the bedding, the pipe is then placed and joined in the trench. Placing large diameter pipe can be considerable challenge as pipe weight can vary significantly. A 120 inch diameter SRP pipe weighs approximately 109 pounds per foot and a 120 inch RCP can weigh upwards of 5,000 pounds per foot. Justin will cover some challenges related to the pipe joining in more detail. A crucial and challenging step with any large diameter pipe installation is haunching, backfill, and compaction. Buried pipelines rely on the interaction with the surrounding soil to carry the load. So all pipeline designs should consider proper soil support and proper installation to provide satisfactory long-term performance. The haunch zone is the undersides of the pipe up to the spring line or midpoint of the pipe. And many engineers consider this the most important factor controlling deflection. Proper haunching creates uniform circumferential support to the pipe barrel and provides a major portion of the pipe's load carrying capability. To do this, workers hand shovel or, or shovel slice the haunch zone material into place or use a pneumatic backfill pull tamper, often referred to as a pogo stick to achieve proper compaction. As I mentioned, proper embedment and backfill placement and compaction is critical to control the load and deflection. There are various categories, types, or classifications of soil, but backfill material is generally a crushed rock, gravel, or sand gravel mixture. These cohesionless backfill materials provide the best pipe support when compacted to their optimal density. General recommendations for large sewer pipe installation typically calls for eight inch backfill lifts. It's also important to maintain equal backfill heights on each side of the pipe. Typical compaction equipment, such as a plate compactor, jumping jack, or a remote sheep's foot compactor are generally used until the minimum construction heights are achieved over the pipe. When placing the initial backfill directly over the pipe on the, the crown and the shoulders, a padding layer of minimal compaction effort should be maintained to avoid disturbing the embedded pipe. The specified backfill material is typically placed to a minimum six to 18 inches over the top of the pipe, depending on the diameter. Final backfill is then placed and compacted up to the surface. And depending on project specifications may include the native trench material. Compaction testing should be performed routinely to ensure proper material densities and optimal moisture control is reached. Compaction testing is generally performed with a nuclear density gauge, which provides quick and accurate in-field results. Most large diameter sewer projects will have a quality assurance quality control plan, which generally includes the compaction testing requirements, material inspections throughout the installation to make sure you're installing the right materials, and ensuring the contractor follows standard installation practices and industry standard means and methods and following any manufacturer procedures. Additionally, post-installation videos, LIDAR, sonar, and GPR technology can be used to verify and document installation performance. Thanks again, everyone, for your interest in this topic. I'll now show a brief installation overview video 
and then pass it back to Jill for a poll question. Thank you, Thomas. So now it's time for our second question. What is your preferred material selection for a 30 inch or larger diameter gravity sanitary sewer system project? Is it fiberglass? Is it PVC? HDPE? SRPE? Or RCP? I'll give you some time now to mark your selections. And to submit your poll question or your poll answer, please click the answer on your computer screen and then click the submit button. And while you're making your selections, I have a quick question for you, Thomas. What does cohesionless backfill mean? Uh, in general terms, cohesionless means that the soil particles don't stick together when they're dry and their strength isn't really affected by water. Whereas cohesive soils have a high clay, clay or silt content and they have an inherent attraction where they stick together or clump together. Uh, a good cohesionless backfill soil is, is important on large diameter installations in order to, ach to achieve compaction. Thank you, Thomas. And it looks like most of you have answered our question, so I'll share the results now. It looks like 6% say fiberglass, 22% say PVC, 36% say HDPE, 10% say SRPE, and 23% say RCP. So I'll turn it back to Bob to introduce our next section. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Thomas. I would just like to reiterate the safety aspect of everything that Thomas said. Uh, none of this really matters if our people don't get to go home safe every night. So uh, let's remember safety while we're out there. Um, so now we're gonna move on to uh, a discussion about pipe jointing. And for that, we're gonna turn to uh, Justin Walton. Justin has been with Contact now for uh, 30 years this year. So uh, congratulations to Justin and uh, let's talk about joints. All right, thank you, Bob. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Hope you're having a great week. So when we look at designing a large diameter conveyance system, whether it's wastewater or stormwater, there are certain design considerations that need to be taken into account, um, specifically with large diameter pipe, things like the hydraulics, the ability of the pipe to get the effluent from point A to point B in the correct velocity and, and quantity. Uh, the pipe needs to have strength. It needs to be able to handle the dead, live, and hydrostatic load that it sees in the field. The joints need to be able to prevent infiltration or exfiltration. Uh, the pipe needs to be within the budget and it needs to uh, install without um, any curve balls. It needs to be a straightforward uh, installation and also the pipe needs to meet the design service life for the project. Now, of these considerations, the joints is very important because if there's an issue or a failure with the joint, it definitely will have an impact on all the other design considerations. Another reason is because joints have been identified as a major red flag for I and I or inflow and infiltration along with cracks in the pipe wall poor structure connections, seepage into manholes, and incorrect lateral tie-ins. And if you're not familiar with I&I, &I, it's inflow and infiltration. And essentially, during a rain event, when stormwater runoff uh, gets into a wastewater line, it inundates the system. And as a result, the wastewater treatment plant sees um, flows that are way above its design capacity. And as a result, the effluent gets backed upstream 
and can potentially bubble out the tops of manholes as you see in the picture below. So that said, what is an acceptable joint? Well, for many years, designers looked to ASTM D3212 uh, for a good joint for their gravity sanitary system or storm sewer system. Uh, and that is the standard specification for joints for drain and sewer plastic pipes using flexible elastomeric seals. Um, this spec was first published in 1973 and it is a laboratory test for reliability and performance of the joint. And it includes uh, a test section of the pipe with a joint and then the ends are capped off and the internal pressure is brought up to 10.8 psi and held for 10 minutes and if there's no leaks that's considered a passing test and the test needs to be done with a straight pipe configuration and also with a vertical ring deflection of five percent Ever since November of 2021, when the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was passed into law, a lot of focus has been placed on growing the U.S. infrastructure. And as our infrastructure grows, so does the need for larger diameter pipe systems, uh, pipe for applications such as storm drainage and sanitary trunk lines, raw water intakes, large irrigation flood control, and wastewater treatment plant outfalls. Um, as Ryan mentioned, when you get up into the larger diameters of pipe, your material options become very limited. Um, some of the more common materials are reinforced concrete pipe, fiberglass pipe, uh, SRPE, steel reinforced polyethylene, uh, also ductile iron and solid wall polyethylene. And the joints for these, these larger material uh, need to, to meet ASTM D3212. And there's a lot of different joint options. Uh, gasketed bell spigot joint. There's a collar joint, which is essentially a sleeve with an internal gasket and a center stop where two plain ends of pipe can be inserted. In the case of ductile iron pressure pipe, there are bolted flange rings and SRPE has the ability to be welded uh, with an internal weld and solid wall polyethylene can be butt welded. And of these materials, um, the, the gasketed bell spigot joint is the most common. And um, I mentioned polyethylene, and I like to take a closer look at that. It's becoming a more widely accepted material, and I want to share some of its advantages, but also some of its limitations when it's used in pipe joint applications. Uh, polyethylene was initially used in pipe in the late 1950s in the oil and gas industry, and it is very highly uh, resistant to many corrosive chemicals that are typically found in stormwater and, and wastewater. Um, and that includes hydrogen sulfide gas, as Ryan mentioned, which anytime you stagnate sanitary effluent, such as at the inlet pipe to a lift station or a pump station or in a sanitary overflow system, the bacteria become active and they create hydrogen sulfide gas, which has a reaction on top of the pipe forming sulfuric acid which is not very friendly to the cement and concrete, but it doesn't bother polyethylene. Uh, polyethylene is sustainable. It requires less energy to fabricate, transport, and install than a lot of other heavier pipe materials. Uh, and you may not be aware, but polyethylene is several times more abrasion resistant than concrete, and it can provide a very long 100 year plus service life. And it is important to note that polyethylene is used today in many critical pipe applications, things like natural gas and potable water and sanitary sewers. However, as I mentioned, it does have some limitations when we look at the use of polyethylene in pipe joints. And that's because HDPE is, is a thermoplastic that's a viscoelastic material and its deformation potential is stress and time dependent. Uh, it's subject to creep, which is deformation over time under strain. And what happens here is as the plastic is loaded, uh, over time, it tends to relax or, or move or shift on a molecular level. And this could potentially compromise the integrity of the joint. It can, it can compromise the integrity of the compression on the gasket. And what Contact does to eliminate that in SRPE pipe is they add steel to the plastic in order to give it strength. And um, steel is a very good material for structural integrity, much better than polyethylene. Uh, if you look at Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity uh, of polyethylene, 
um, it's 152,000 PSI, whereas the modulus of steel is 29 million PSI. So it's important to have steel uh, in the plastic to do the heavy lifting. And in the application of a joint, you wanna make sure that the steel is not only in the spigot, but also in the bell. So it's on both sides of the gasket and it's able to uh, maintain compression on that gasket for the life of the pipe. Another good design practice when it comes to joints and large diameter pipe conveyance systems is if you can minimize the number of joints in the system, then that is going to be good insurance against future issues like I&I. &I. And just looking at a typical 2000 foot sewer, it could be wastewater, could be stormwater, say 72 inch diameter. If you were to design that system with reinforced concrete pipe at standard eight foot lengths, it would result in a conveyance system with 250 joints. Whereas if you designed it out of SRPE at 24 foot lengths, it would only be 83 joints. So minimizing the number of joints equates to added insurance against future issues and maintenance. Also note the pick weight of the different pipe materials. Lighter, longer pipe sections means a faster installation time, which can save costs for your client. And then finally, if the conveyance system is going to be subjected to a low pressure air test or a hydrostatic leak down test post installation, uh, having fewer joints in the system means less time and money spent testing. And Andrew is gonna talk a little bit more about joint testing. And now I'll pass it back over to Jill. And I think we have another poll question. You are correct, Justin. Here is our final poll question for today. How often do you see installed joint testing for pipe diameters 72 inches and larger? Never, sometimes, or often? I'll give you some time now to mark your selections. And just a reminder, if you have a question, type it in the question box and I will ask it at the end of the presentation. I actually have a really good question for you, Justin, so I'll ask it right now. What type of gasket is used for the Duramax quick joint? So the, the rubber gasket that's used in uh, all Duramax joints is a sanitary sewer grade gasket. Um, it meets ASTM F477 and it's a, a double fluted gasket. So, and it's deep seated so that when the contractor is homing the joint in the field, the gasket's designed to stay put where it will not roll. And um, Another thing to note is that the gasket is on the spigot end of the pipe and it ships to the job site already attached to the pipe. Thank you, Justin. And it looks like most of you have answered the question. So I'll share the results now. It looks like 51% say never, 36% say sometimes, and 12% say often. So now I'll pass it over to you, Bob. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Justin. So for our last major section here, we're gonna uh, look at post-installation leak testing. And uh, for that, we're gonna turn to Andrew Jenkins. Andrew Jenkins has been with Contact for more than 30 years, and he is our area pipe manager for the Northeast of the US. And Andrew, let's talk about pipe joints. Good deal, thanks, Bob, thanks, guys. So um, the next kind of challenge that we're gonna wrap up here with is the, um, like you said, leak testing. Again, I'll reiterate, we're not talking about the collection sizes of sanitary or small diameter storm sewer. We're talking about the big stuff, you know, 48, 60, 120 inch, whatever it might be. And interesting standard wise, when we're trying to um, test the newly installed product in the ground, um, I'd say these are the industry standards that I see the most around the country being specified on projects. Uh, you know, those who do sanitary sewer work probably recognize, recognize the ASTM F1417. That's the plastic sewer low pressure air test specification. And uh, again, that's done every day all across the country. It's referenced in various regulations, uh, but it's mainly that four through 15 inch collection sewer type sizes. Um, and uh, it does have a limitation for the bigger stuff. Matter of fact, I think it caps out around 60 inch. Um, the next one that you see a lot of is ASTM C924, which is the concrete version, a little shorter of a test, uh, but it's again limited in size. There is on rare occasions, you'll see a hydrostatic drawdown test. Uh, C969 is a, a popular one. It's a, a concrete pipe uh, test. Um, 
sometimes you see a lot of visual uh, inspection requirements or maybe none at all. And that kind of lines up with what the poll just gave us as far as feedback, especially on the big diameter stuff. And I, I think we chose 72 inch to really see uh, where the limitation might be. And, and since ASTM 1417 ends at 60, I'm thinking 70, 72 inch. I wonder how often do the engineers see that? So thank you for participating in that poll. And then lastly, there's ASTM C1103. Uh, you don't see that spec often, um, but it is associated with the joint isolation test. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a, a few seconds. So ASTM 1417, um, for those in the sewer industry, you're well familiar with what this test is. For those who are not, basically we're bagging up two manholes um, and we're going to apply a low pressure air in between the two bags. And we're going to measure its drawdown uh, leakage rate, um, other uh, whether it's a half a percent or a half a psi to one psi. Now these are low pressures, uh, not exceeding four psi. So anywhere between two and four is what you see specified by regulators. Now I'll note note two. It says consult with a pipe manufacturer for maximum test pressures for diameters of thirty inches or greater. Okay, and there's a reason for that. Um, you don't see this test being specified or used for the bigger diameter stuff now the spec does go up to 60 inch but um, it really comes down to uh, the safety of this test you know if you were to do a 60 inch pipe low pressure air test the amount of thrust force on that bag is a, approximately 10 11 000 pounds in around 4 psi so it is very dangerous um, also when you're using the the timing method for it, it's based off of the diameter and the length of the run. Um, those large diameters get really long, like we're talking hours and hours of holding that pressure. So quite often you, you see people kind of use that ASTM and then manipulate it for what they think is practical. Uh, but it is limited and quite often um, at 30 inches and above, you see something a little bit different uh, being prescribed by the, the manufacturer. Same thing with the concrete version. Um, it has a note that says for pipe diameters larger than 24 inch, um, it's acceptable to or even be more convenient to inspect by visual inspection or the individual joint testing. And that's that C1103 I mentioned earlier. We'll talk about in, this, in a second. But it's pretty much the same test. Uh, a little less time as far as how long to hold the pressures, but the pressures are very equivalent to the one used in the plastic industry. Again, they're mainly using the small diameter. So we have a gap in the industry for the large diameter set, for the interceptors, for the trunk lines, for the outfalls. Um, hydrostatic testing. I had said it's rare. You might live in a community in the United States where you do it all the time. Uh, but it's rare for a couple of reasons. One, in the sewer industry, uh, you know, the water resources just might not be there. So you can think about a large diameter pipe, how much, how many gallons of water would need to fill up a 72 inch interceptor or storm sewer after you plugged up two manholes and, you know, the time to fill that up, the, you know, the expense of that time. So that's why I say it's more rarely used. We do see it in our detention or underground storage uh, pipe systems, but uh, for sewer, eh, not that often. It is much more safe to, to do than um, a low pressure air test. So that's an advantage, uh, but uh, it, uh, it is kind of more rare in the industry. And then lastly, when we are in the big diameter sets, this is kind of where most people will just point towards. They say, hey, just we'll do a visual inspection. And that's great. Some people will use a uh, closed camera, CCTV. Uh, there's some really cool technology out there that does uh, really amazing things with uh, laser profiling, etc. Uh, but it's really better suited to kind of see the condition of the pipe or uh, maybe the shape of the pipe as far as angularity of the joints, uh, any kind of differential settlement, uh, ovality of, of the pipe for flexible products. So it's limited what you can see. I mean, if you can see a, a leak, you know it's there. But um, maybe in the future, you don't know, you don't understand the competency of the joint. So it's limited. And that leads us to kind of the last option here, which is this joint isolation testing equipment. So what we're doing is we're rolling down the, the, the sewer, a large apparatus 
that has two bladders that isolates a joint. Now we have a, a faster, easier test because the, the annulus of that bladder space is much smaller. Um, it's, it's pretty cool technology, but again, it can be problematic, meaning uh, you have all sorts of types of technologies in bladders and apparatus type designs. Uh, some have sizes that go up to the, the ultra large diameter, some don't. It can be expensive to rent or purchase. Um, and uh, it's again, time consuming. Um, it can be expensive. I mean, for concrete pipe, you're moving this thing every six or eight feet. Uh, for other products, you're moving it every 14 foot. And when you have a half mile or a mile of a trunk line, um, it can be more expensive and time consuming. So there's not a lot of options for us in the large diameter. So that's kind of the challenges you got to think through. So with that, um, I don't know. I don't think we have any more polls. Jill, unless there's a question I can answer, we'll pass it off to, to Bob and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, sadly, there's no more poll questions. So we'll just send it over to Bob. Thank you, Jill and Andrew. And thank you guys for uh, doing a great job here. So. We're going to uh, finish up here with a quick discussion on how content can uh, help you folks with these types of uh, projects. Uh, just real quick here, we develop uh, piping systems uh, in several different product categories. Uh, our corrugated metal pipe is available from 12 to 144 inch in several different coatings and, and uh, configurations. We also have PVC pipe from four inch to 36 inch, again, in several different varieties uh, to meet different application. And then we have our Duramax or our SRPE steel reinforced polyethylene pipe. Uh, Duramax is available from 30 inch to 120 inch. Uh, so what is Duramax? As um, Ryan talked about the value and the benefits of adding multiple materials together in a composite pipe material. Duramax takes advantage of the strength of the steel and the long-term durability of HDPE to provide a product that has the uh, uh, load bearing capacity that is needed, but uh, will stand up to all the uh, corrosive effects of H2S and other, other uh, corrosive agents. Again, available from 120 inch with a very, or from 30 to 120 inch with a variety of different jointing options. And uh, we produce this product up to 48 foot length. So we can, um, like uh, uh, Justin mentioned, we can minimize the number of joints that are required. So uh, as promised, we are going to talk real quickly about a new product that we've developed and introduced just in the past week or two. Quick Joint is a new joint that is available for Duramax pipe. It will be available for deliveries in the second half of this year. We're just finding finalizing uh, production right now. Uh, quick joint is a bell and spigot joint that is available for the entire product diameter range. So all the way up to 120 inch. It is uh, a bell and spigot that is reinforced in the bell and the spigot with high strength steel. So you create that steel sandwich that maintains the long-term compression of the gasket. Additionally, we have doubled up the gaskets, so there are two gaskets. That does two things for us. One, it gives uh, more reliability that you're going to get a good seal. Uh, and Something happened to one gasket or it didn't get pushed in all the way, you got a better likelihood that the second one's good. Uh, and the other thing it does is it creates a space between those two gaskets that we can access and pressurize. And we can, within minutes, with very, very inexpensive equipment, do a fuel verification test on each and every joint. So we have a, a, a video real quick that's gonna explain it and I'll come back. Confirming in-ground joint performance has always been a time and resource consuming challenge, especially for large diameter pipe projects. Contec has solved this issue by creating Quick Joint with ultra high performance technology and innovative joint solution for the Duramax steel reinforced polyethylene or SRPE piping system that allows for easy in-ground pressure testing to confirm proper installation and performance. The Duramax SRPE piping system is manufactured in accordance with ASTM 2562 and Ashto M335 and MP40 standards. 
Duramax's quick joint is manufactured to meet the requirements of ASTM D3212 and to allow contractors to install the product quickly and without the need for specialized equipment or expertise. Quick joint is designed to provide ease of installation and long-term reliable compression of redundant gaskets between high-strength steel that is fully encapsulated by high-density polyethylene, or HDPE. Quick joint's enhanced bell flare and innovative spigot chamfer allow for quick and efficient alignment and installation, especially in tough trench conditions. Duramax provides the lightweight, low-cost structural advantages of traditional HDPE with none of the disadvantages. The quick joint UHP bell and spigot can easily be lined up and joined in the trench. Pipe segments are available in lengths up to 48 feet and in diameters ranging from 30 to 120 inches. For large diameter pipe projects, confirming in-ground joint performance has always been a time and resource consuming challenge. With Duramax's new and enhanced quick joint, testing can be accomplished in minutes, utilizing readily available and inexpensive equipment. You can rely on the same quality you've come to expect from Duramax, but now with an enhanced new joint capable of in-ground pressure testing to confirm correct installation and performance. Experience the next step in the evolution of pipe with Duramax SRPE and Quick Joint UHP, an innovative, reliable, and efficient solution from Contech. To learn more, please visit conteches.com slash Duramax. Okay, so that's Quick Joint, and uh, please contact us with any questions. Uh, we've got some great questions that have been submitted, so I'm going to kind of fly through these next few slides. Um, we're here to help you. Uh, we've got a, a great team in the field, and uh, we ask that you just reach out to us with any questions you have. You can start online. We've got a lot of good tools there that can uh, direct you towards information. Uh, and then also we have uh, a great uh, tool online that can help you find your local sales engineer to to answer any questions you have. Finally, the team that has presented today is part of our area pipe manager team. They have responsibility specifically for Duramax and they are available to you and to support our field sales team. With that, I think uh, we, like I said, we've got some great questions. I'll turn it over to Jill to ask us questions. That's great, Bob. Our first question is probably for Andrew Jenkins. How long would a test be for a 120 inch diameter quick joint? Um, it'll probably be ready, uh, something per the regulatory body uh, or the engineer of record, um, but per the ASTM that exists called 1103, which would be similar to what we're doing, it's just for, uh, you know, a minute or less is all you need because, um, again, we're, we're testing a very small space in between two gaskets, so there's not a lot of, you know, wait time as far as things um, coming into balance or anything like that. So uh, it, it, it could, you know, it could even be said as 30 seconds maybe. Uh, I can't remember exactly what ASTM 1103 is, but I believe it's like five or 10 seconds. It's something very, very short. It's, you, you pressurize it, you see it, it holds, you're good and you move on. But um, it's somewhere in, in that range. Thank you, Andrew. Our next question, maybe Bob can answer this one. What methods are best for keeping pipe from floating during installation? Uh, that's a great question. So um, pipe flotation is, is can be somewhat anti-intuitive uh, or counterintuitive. Um, initially, you would think that heavy pipes don't float and light pipes do. Uh, that's that's partially true, but uh, if, if the joints are working correctly, then air gets trapped in the pipe and, and they could float, right? So um, we look at a variety of different methods. And again, our, our field teams are there to help you figure this out. But um, you start with the backfill, right? If you have sufficient cover and proper backfill, that often is enough to keep and prevent flotation. Uh, if that's not, then there are a variety of different uh, methods that are used. Uh, to anchor the pipe uh, or uh, to add uh, uh, weight above the pipe to hold it down. So 
there's a lot of different ways to do it and we're here to help you figure them out. Thank you, Bob. Our next question is probably for Ryan. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about compaction testing and aggregate. So how do you perform compaction testing with aggregate backfill? Yeah, there, there have been a lot of questions. And the, the, the biggest challenge you have with an open graded or aggregate backfill is you, you can't run a compaction test on it, right? Uh, so, so we still recommend the same type of installation techniques in that uh, you're, you're, you're using lifts, eight to 10 inch loose lifts, and then you're shovel slicing the material into the haunch area, which is most critical. And then from there, um, if you, you can run just a plate compactor over each lift or, or some other type of compactor to, to make sure that you settle the soil. But beyond that, uh, there really isn't a test that I'm familiar with anyway that that could be used outside of a visual from uh, from an inspector who's seeing that yeah the material is getting into the haunch areas. So I don't know, guys. Feel free to chime in if you have anything to add to that. Uh, but it's been a lot of questions about that specifically. Yeah, I, you're right. I mean, dumping it, it it's considered a 750 to a thousand psi of soil side uh, stiffness. Doing exactly what you just said, getting some sort of uh, compaction effort, uh, tamping it down, doing it lifts is pretty much widely recognized to get in that two to 3,000 PSI soil site stiffness zone just by applying any sort of consolidation effort to it. Thank you, Ryan and Andrew. Our next question is probably for Justin. Are there any ways to measure the deflection of a pipe following installation? Yes. Um, so with, especially with large diameter pipe, um, the SRPE pipe, the Duramax that Bob mentioned, um, first of all, it has a maximum allowable deflection of 5%. So it's important to note that it looks like a plastic pipe, but because it has steel reinforcing it, it, it really behaves from a structural standpoint like a steel pipe. So it has very high maximum allowable deflection limits. And <clears throat> with larger diameter pipe, um, you can do traditional methods. Um, sometimes uh, I see um, very agricultural approaches used where uh, for pipe large enough to walk through, you can take a staff or a rod and you can go through the pipe with that and, and measure it. Uh, you can take a mandrel uh, or a section of pipe that is uh, slightly smaller than the ID of the pipe you're trying to measure and run that mandrel section through the pipe uh, as a deflection test. Thank you, Justin. And we have time for one last question and it's probably gonna go to Thomas. What is meant when the design refers to the central bedding zone? Um, the, the central bedding zone is, is really just the area directly under the pipe. Um, typical designs call for that, typically about a, a third of the pipe's diameter. Um, some designs may not require that the same bedding material be, you know, spread across the entire bottom of the trench in order to save on some of that bedding gravel. So they may just call it a central bedding zone to support the, the bottom of the pipe and the foundation. Well, thank you, Thomas, Justin, Bob, Ryan, and Andrew. And thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. If your question was not answered, a contact representative will reach out to you with the response really quick. A uh, survey will appear once we conclude the webinar. Please complete the short survey to receive your PDH credit. A follow-up email will be sent by the end of the day that will include a link with instructions on how to download your PDH certificate. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank yeah. you.